Let's turn now in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 26. Now, when we got into the 25th chapter of the book of Exodus, we began with the construction of the tabernacle. And first of all, God informed him concerning the furnishings that were to be in the tabernacle. And so in chapter 29, it is described for Moses how that the um, Ark of the Covenant is to be built its dimensions. The mercy seat, which was the lid on the Ark of the Covenant with the two carved cherubim. And then the furnishings for the outer holy place of the temple were to be a lampstand with seven uh, lamps. The table, which was to have twelve loaves of bread kept on it. And then the altar of incense. Now we, as we get into chapter 26, begin the construction of the tabernacle itself. And first of all, the Lord gives instructions to these curtains that are to be over the top. Now, the tabernacle is really a tent. And thus you've got to picture it in your mind sort of as a tent. And first of all, he describes the curtains that go over the top of this tent. The bottom curtain, and there are three layers of curtains actually, and the bottom curtain is to be made of linen. And they are to take Ten curtains of fine twine linen, blue, purple, scarlet, with cherubims and cunning work shalt thou make them. And the length of one curtain shall be twenty-eight cubits, or forty-two feet. And the breadth would be four cubits, or six feet. And all of the curtains are to be the same measurement. Then they are to take five of the curtains and couple them together so that five would be sewed together which makes now a curtain uh, of 30 feet by 42 feet. And so you have two then large curtains of linen. Now the interior part is got all of these neat little embroidered cherubims and fancy needlework so that as you go into the tabernacle and you look up, you see all of these cherubim that have been woven into the fabric of this linen. Remember, this is a model of heaven. Heaven is filled with angels. And so uh, the idea of going into the tabernacle and the consciousness of the presence of the angels of God that are there in heaven. So the cherubim uh, all uh, sewn in in fine needlework in this linen curtain. Then the curtains were to have these golden rings uh, sewed on them, the loops of blue on the edge of one curtain at the salvage, a coupling like you shall make, and they were to make these loops and then these golden tacks, 50 loops, and then these golden tacks, and they were to be tacked together at this loop so that you ultimately end up with one curtain that can be taken apart and folded into the two. Now, you get the idea? Uh, It is uh, actually... uh, There are to be two large curtains, 30 feet by 42 feet, but yet they are to be... They are to have these 50 loops and then golden tacks by which the loops are held together so that when they put it over the top of the tabernacle... It makes one large curtain. But the tabernacle is to be a portable building. It's to move whenever they move. And so the thing all has to be made so that it is portable. 
so that it can be taken down and, and carried away. And just one curtain, uh, 60 by 42, would be much too large to try to move. So it's clipped together in the middle so that they can take it apart and then move on with it uh, when God indicated that it was time to move. Everything was portable. Uh, you remember when they made the ark, they had the gold rings on it and then these uh, pieces of acacia wood overlaid with gold that went through the rings. They weren't to touch it, but the porters could just pick up the staves and they carried the ark between them. The same was true on the table of showbread. and all. It was all made so that it was portable. They could move it uh, from place to place. And so it really is a well-designed, portable building uh, that was the tent, the tabernacle, uh, the place, and it means the place of meeting. It was where the people were to meet God. Now, somehow, uh, uh, along the line in history, we've gotten a wrong concept uh, that the church is God's house. The church is not God's house. God doesn't dwell in buildings made by men's hands. When Solomon built the temple, he recognized, hey, we're not building a house really for God. For he said, the heavens of heavens cannot contain God. So it is a place of meeting. It's the place where I can come and meet God. Now, we could meet God anywhere. God will meet you wherever you want to meet Him. God will meet you on the beach. God will meet you on the freeway. You name it. God can meet you anywhere. But when we want to gather together to meet together, to fellowship, to have a place of meeting in a corporate sense, then the building comes in handy. If we lived in Hawaii, we wouldn't need a building. We could meet the Lord under the banyan trees. And that's great. But here is a place where we gather to meet God. We don't think of this as God's house at all. Tomorrow it's just an empty building. Tonight it's the church. Or the place where the church meets. You're the church. And so this becomes the place where the church gathers to meet together in a corporate sense with God. Now, the tabernacle was the place of meeting where people would meet God. But you see, they didn't have Jesus Christ. And thus, they couldn't just meet God anywhere because God is a holy God and if you meet God, you might just fry because of your sin and His holiness. And so, in the Old Testament period, you wouldn't dare meet God. Thus, in order to meet God, they had a place and then they had a ritual by which you could meet God, but not yourself directly you would come to the priest and the priest would go before God for you and then the priest would come back to you for God. But you just wouldn't meet God directly yourself in the Old Testament. And so they called it the place of meeting where the people could come to the priest, offer their sacrifice and the priest would go before God for them. This was that place, the tabernacle. And this lasted actually all the way up through the reign of David. They still at David's time had a tabernacle. It wasn't until Solomon built the temple that the tabernacle was finally uh, done away with. So, the first curtain over the top of the tabernacle was of linen. And uh, basically 60 feet by 42 feet. Now, the next curtain was of goat's hair. Now, the first one is, is really for the ornament on the inside with the fancy needlework. 
Now the next one is sort of as a protection of sorts. And the second curtain over the top of the first was of goat's hair. And there were to be eleven of these, and so it was to be a little bit bigger than the first. It's to drape down a little further over the linen one. And again, the length of one will be 30 cubits or 45 feet instead of 42. And six feet wide, but then they were to sew six of them together and five of them together, again making the loops and the, and the tacks whereby they were to be tacked together. Now these tacks, though, on the goat skins were to be of brass. Now, with the goat skins, it, it, the fact that they had to use these goat skins or goat hair indicated the death of the animal. And wherever you have the death of the animal, you're thinking now in the terms of sacrifice and uh, the judgment for sin. Thus, wherever anything has to do with judgment, your metal becomes brass. For brass is the metal that is symbolic of judgment. So wherever there was animal and the death of animals and so forth, brass was used because that's a sign of the judgment against sin. So this second curtain over the top, a little bit bigger than the first, it is 45 feet by uh, 62. And it's to hang over both ends and down the sides and to cover completely over the linen uh, curtain. And uh, this is more of a protective covering. And then the third covering was of badgers or ram skins dyed red, a covering above the badger's skins. Now this is for waterproof. This is the outer covering and it's the waterproof. And so there are actually three coverings over the tabernacle. And uh, thus, as I say, it makes quite a tent. Now there were to be these boards, 15 feet high and 27 feet wide of acacia wood. And they were to be overlaid with gold. And then they were to make these silver sockets. And these boards were to be sort of tongue and grooved, fitting in together, fitting in the silver sockets in the bottom. And then with the, uh, the rings in the side so that they could set the boards up and then run a stave through the rings so that the boards would stand upright. And so... Uh, the uh, boards were to, of course, the, the, the tabernacle itself was to be 45 feet long and 15 feet wide. These boards, and of course the entrance at the front of it, and they describe how they are to make the entrance, but these boards are set in sockets of silver, side by side, and then over the top of it would be the hanging linen curtain, the hanging goat hair curtain uh, or goat skin, and then over the top of that, the waterproofing, the badger skin over the top of that. And uh, these, these big 27 inches wide boards, they're 27 inches wide and they are 15 feet high. And with these rings so that when they'd set them up, they could run the sticks through them and thus they would stand upright and uh, the curtains then going over the top. And uh, he describes uh, how that they are to set them uh, in this shape, rectangular shape, of 45 feet by 15 feet. And uh, the tabernacle itself had two rooms in it. The outer room is 30 by 15, and then the Holy of Holy is a 15-foot cube. They're 15 feet high. It's 15 feet wide, 15 feet long. So it's actually a cube uh, in the Holy of Holies. So as you would enter into the Holy of Holies, of course, there was no light in there except for 
what they called the Shekinah, which was just a uh, incandescent type of light, a glow that just filled the room. It was the light of the glory of the presence of God there in the Holy of Holies. But no one was allowed in there except the high priest. Now, uh, he describes how they are to make these silver sockets and set the uh, bars on the outside. In verse 26, also make bars of acacia wood. And uh, the, the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, five bars for the board on the side, on the two sides, the westward, and so forth. And then the bar in the middle that would reach from end to end so that they could run them through these golden or through these rings and uh, hold the thing up. Now, separating the rooms on the inside was to be a veil. Now, there are sources in history, whether or not they are accurate, we do not know, but that when they made the veil in the temple to separate the Holy of Holies, there are some records that state that the veil in the temple itself was 18 inches thick, woven together, just really a heavy, heavy, thick veil in the temple. And that is the veil that was rent, torn from the top to the bottom when Jesus was crucified. Of course, symbolic of the fact that God through Jesus Christ has opened the door for all men to come freely unto Him. Access to God no longer limited to just the high priests. Access to God now open to every one of us because of the rent veil of the temple. But here is described the veil that they are to make for this uh, holy of holies, the inner veil. Thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet. Fine twine linen, cunning work, with cherubims it shall be made. So again, the cherubims uh, woven into it. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of acacia wood that are overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold and the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang the veil under the tax that uh, you may bring thither within the veil the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And thou shalt set the table outside the veil, the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And thou shalt put the table on the north side. And thou shalt make a hanging for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet, fine twine linen wrought with needlework. And thou shalt make for the hanging five pillars of acacia wood and overlay them with gold and their hooks shall be of gold. And thou shalt cast five sockets of brass for them. Because there they would come in with the blood of the sacrifices and thus the brass sockets for those particular uh, gold overlaid acacia staves. So I trust that you're getting sort of a mental picture of this. It's a tent. Golden boards forming the walls around it. So that when you walk into the tabernacle itself, you would have to go through this first veil. You would enter into this room that is 15 feet high. And as you looked up, you would see the linen with the uh, cherubims and so forth that are woven into the uh, material. Over on your right side, you would see the table of showbread. And on your left side, you would see the lampstand. And in front of you would be another curtain with cherubims and all woven in it. If you would go past the second curtain in there, 
you would see a golden box that is sitting with a golden lid on top and carved on the top of that golden lid would be these cherubims with outstretched wings. And thus you get an idea of what the tabernacle looked like on the inside. Now, on the outside, they were to make a court which would be 75 feet wide and 150 feet long with curtains around it seven and a half feet high so that you have this outer court which is sort of a curtained-in area, 75 feet by 150 feet. So it would be um, just about, the, the outer court would be just about the well, just about as, as large as the building here is wide. And um, it would be 75, which would take us back to about the... Uh, between the third and the fourth pillar back here, that wide, and, and picture it in the building this long. Curtains that are 70, or seven and a half feet high, which makes them too high to tiptoe and peek over. And uh, these curtains were set on these posts that were set in brass sockets and so forth. And the whole thing, as I said, was portable. When they need to move, they could just go in, take the thing apart, wrap it up. And, the, and there were certain of the tribe of Levites that were the bearers. They had to carry the thing and they would take it to the next place and then they could set it up. It's like uh, a tent is easily mobile and, and thus uh, it, was, it was made very portable and uh, able to move it around as God would lead the children of Israel. And so this court, now in the court, again, he follows, first of all, the furnishings in this court are to be a brass altar. Now, so make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long, which would be seven and a half feet. And so it is a square. The altar of Acacia wood, but now it is overlaid with brass because we have the symbol of judgment where the sacrifices were to be burnt unto the Lord. And so it is seven and a half feet square on the top. It is four and a half feet high. And on each corner there is a horn. Uh, the, it was carved in a, in a horn shape coming up. And... Uh, so there were the four horns on each of the corners of this seven and a half foot uh, altar, four and a half feet high, all overlaid with brass. And as he first of all gave you the furnishings of the tabernacle and then the tabernacle, so the furnishings of the outer court and then the description of how the outer court uh, was to be made. Now in verse 20 we get to the oil for the light, and you uh, shall command the children of Israel that they bring pure olive oil, beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. In the tabernacle of the congregation, outside of that holy of holy veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever unto their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. So they were to use olive oil in these cups in this golden lampstand and Aaron and his sons, it was their duty to keep the oil in there constantly so that the light never went out. And so uh, as we get into history, uh, we remember uh, the case where uh, Samuel, when he was just growing up, He was brought by his mother who had dedicated him to the Lord, to the priest. 
Eli, the high priest, and, and Samuel became sort of an errand boy. And one night he heard his name being called. And he ran into Eli and he said, what did you want? He said, I didn't call you. What are you doing here? I said, I surely heard my name called. Now I go back to bed. He went back to bed and again he heard his name called. And uh, came running in again. And, and Eli says, no, I didn't call you. What's going on? Get back to bed. And so the next time, Eli said, look, if you hear someone calling again, just say, speak, Lord, your servant hears. And so he heard his name called again and he said, speak, Lord, your servant hears. Well, the Lord was trying to tell him that the, the oil was going out. Someone had failed in the job there in the lights. And so uh, the beginning of his listening to the Lord and, and all involved this uh, lights that were to be kept burning. Uh, during the time that the temple was profaned by Antiochus Epiphanes, when he offered a pig on the altar and just spread its blood around the temple. Judas Maccabeus, so incensed over this sacrilege, put an idol of Zeus within the temple. Judas Maccabee is so incensed that he gathered together some of the Israelis and they went out against insurmountable odds and wiped out the Syrian host, the men of Antiochus. And they then cleansed, to re, you know, rededicated the temple. But they had only enough oil for one day for the lampstand. Now, it took a process of time. It took, as they developed the whole thing, you know, after a while you get men's routines in it and you get all kinds of rules and regulations. And by this time, it took seven days to get this olive oil all purified by the rituals and all. And so, uh, it, they knew that they weren't going to be able to prepare any olive oil for seven, you know, take them seven days before they could prepare it for the use. And so, Miraculously, as the story goes, though they had only a one-day supply of oil, the lights remained for the eight days until the eighth day they were able to make the oil. And thus, you have the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, uh, the lighting of the candles, and one candle each day, the eight days and so forth, the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, which celebrates God's miraculous supply of oil for uh, Judas Maccabeus at that particular period of their history. Now, as we get into chapter 28, we now move into the priesthood. We now have the tabernacle constructed, at least the, the architecture, the designs, it's on, the blueprints are drawn. And now, getting to the priest. Take thou unto the Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Even Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And so... They were to wear these, these robes. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with my spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And so uh, God was going to fill men with the spirit of wisdom, giving them the skills to make these robes. And these are the garments which thou shalt make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, an embroidered coat, a mitre or a crown, and a girdle, a sash. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, now the ephod, sort of a 
cloak that was worn over the shoulders and down, of gold and blue and of purple and of scarlet, with cunning work. It shall, and it shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof, and it will be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod which is upon it shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue, of purple, scarlet, and fine twin linen. Thou shalt take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the children of Israel. So that these onyx stones were actually to tack this ephod here at the shoulders, to, uh, to tack it together here at his shoulders. But on these onyx were the names of the children of Israel so that whenever the priest would go before God, he was always bearing the names of the children of Israel, that is the tribes of Israel, on his shoulders. Whenever he would go before God, there in the onyx stones, there in his shoulders, the tribes of Israel uh, would be six on each shoulder uh, being carried before God. With the worker, the engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you'll engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel and shall make them to be set in the ouches of gold. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulder of the ephod for stones of a memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. And you'll make the ouches of gold and the two chains of pure gold at the ends uh, wreathen work shalt thou make them and fasten the wreathen chains to the arches. Now the breastplate on his chest, there was this breastplate that he was to wear. The breastplate of judgment with cunning work, the work of the ephod shalt thou make it, of gold and blue and purple and scarlet, of fine twine linen shalt thou make it. It shall be a square and uh, it shall be doubled, four squares shall it be being doubled. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. Now, a span is the, diff, the, the length between your thumb and your finger. So, a square like this, this little breastplate that the priest wore on his chest. And thou shalt set in it the settings of stones, four rows and three stones in each row. The first row shall be sardis, topaz, carbuncle. The second shall be an emerald, sapphire, and a diamond. The third shall be a, a lingur, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth shall be a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. So these precious stones. And they shall be set in gold in their enclosings. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, every one with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. And so there was to be a golden chain holding this breastplate over his chest so that actually he was bearing now not only the names of the children of Israel on his shoulders before the Lord, but over his heart. The names of the tribes of Israel over his heart as they were engraved uh, on uh, each stone representing one of the tribes and the names of the tribes engraved under the stones. So, verse 29, Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goes in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. So as he comes into the presence of God, he's bearing really the names of the tribes of Israel on his shoulders, on his heart. Now in verse 30, the Urim and the Thummim. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim. And they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Now what is the Urim and the Thummim? <laughs> really... Uh, the, uh, the words mean lights and perfections. I really don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us what the Urim and the Thummim actually are. But in years to come, 
when they wanted to hear from God, they would oftentimes come to the priest to inquire of the Lord. And the Urim and the Thummim had something to do with inquiring of God. Because they would come to the priest with the Urim and the Thummim and he would inquire of the Lord for them. So when David wanted to know, shall we go out to battle? Rather than just going out to battle, he would come to the priest and say, inquire of the Lord, shall we go to battle? And the priest with the Urim and the Thummim would inquire of God and say, yes, go. And, and then they would continue to get directions. Now, some believe that the Urim and the Thummim were actually two stones, a black stone and a white stone. And that in the inquiring of the Lord, the priest would reach in and pull out one of the stones. If he pulled out the white stone, it was God saying yes. If he pulled out the black stone, it was God saying no. And that is one of the most prominent theories of what the Urim and the Thummim actually were. Two stones by which the, the priest would say, God, you know, show us, shall we go now? And he'd pull in and if the white stone would come out, yes, we go now. If the black stone would go out, no, we wait. And then uh, they would keep asking questions that could be answered by yes and no. Inquiring of the Lord for directions and guidance. It is interesting, in the New Testament, the disciples were following a somewhat similar kind of leading when they were wanting to choose a replacement for Judas Iscariot. They, they sort of drew straws. They cast lots. Now, the casting of lots is, is much the same. It is... Uh, and this was a method, casting of lots was a method used quite often by people to determine the will of God. You remember Saul used the casting of lots uh, to determine who had disobeyed his order. He said, you know, we'll divide all of Israel and Jonathan and my son and we'll cast lots and the lots fell on Saul and Jonathan. He said, Jonathan, what did you do? And so the casting of lots was a, was a method by which they sought from God answers. Now, all of us desire to be led by God. And we would like to make sure that it is God leading And we remember where Gideon put out his fleece of wool seeking that God would lead by the fleece. Lord, are you really in this thing? Let the ground be dry and the fleece be wet so that I can know that you're really in it. And then the next night, Lord, let the fleece be dry and the ground be wet. He didn't know but what maybe he had stumbled on some phenomena of nature that fleece will always get wet at night in the ground even when it is dry and maybe it's just a phenomena of nature. So, Lord, let's reverse this and see if it works the other way. Whereby he was seeking to be sure of the leading of God. Now, we would love to have some way that we could be sure of the leading of God. But this is almost like flipping a coin. And I surely, wouldn't I surely wouldn't recommend that. Heads I go, tails I stay. God let it land, you know. According to your will. I knew of a fellow who used to seek the leading of the Lord by putting ten pennies in his pocket. And as he would pray and ask God for guidance, he would take out the pennies and put them down. And if they all came up, all ten came up heads, 
he took that as a yes indication from God. In the other combination, he accepted as a no. Well, you know, if they all come up heads, you are fighting some pretty good odds now. The amazing thing, every once in a while, they would all come up heads. The idea is that we would all like some kind of a sure method of knowing when God is saying yes and when God is saying no. But the problem is we don't always give God all the alternatives. Lord, which one shall it be, Matthias or Barsabas, that you have chosen to take Judas' place? So casting lots between Matthew and Barsabas was not good because God had a third party that they didn't even know at that time except as an enemy. A zealot Jew, Paul, or Saul of Tarsus. Oh, surely God doesn't want him. Never put his name in the pot, you know, because no way would God have want him. So we don't always give God all the alternatives. We so often say, Lord, shall it be this or that? Well, it maybe it will be something entirely different from this or that. Something I haven't even thought of. Now, I'm sorry that there is no surefire way of getting a yes or a no like tossing a coin or pulling out a black or a white rock. We walk by faith. What I do is when I begin the day, I say, God, my life is yours. You guide in the circumstances of this day. I commit this day to you. Bring to pass your will in my life. And then I just have to trust God to do it. And I accept the things that come in the day as from the Lord and the leading of the Spirit. I believe that my life becomes the revelation of God's will as I submit myself to Him. If in all of your ways you acknowledge Him, he will direct your path. Where you get into trouble is by jumping in because you think, oh man, look at this good deal. <laughs> you don't th you think, oh man, you know, don't even need to inquire of the Lord on this one. It's quite obvious. Such a good deal, I don't even have to ask. You know, that's where I get in trouble. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. The walk of faith is always a difficult walk. It isn't easy. As I say, we would like it much better if we could get some very positive indications of yes or no. It's hard to just walk by faith trusting God. It can be very confusing. If we keep getting blocked in something we're attempting to do? Is it God saying no or is it Satan trying to hinder me from doing the work of God, you know? And so, it's so difficult at times to, to really know when to persevere and, and when to realize, hey, I'm trying to buck God. God isn't wanting me to do this. I surely wish that I could have a more positive, definite way of ascertaining when God wants me to move, when God doesn't want me to move. I don't. I'm just like you are. I just pray and then I trust God and then I move and then I hope I've done the right thing. And I trust that God is great enough that if I haven't, He knows my heart, He knows the sincerity of my heart, and I've done the wrong thing, He'll, knowing the sincerity of my heart, overlook it. And help me to correct it. 
So we really don't know exactly what the Urim and the Thummim was. I am convinced that I know what it wasn't. I know that it wasn't what Joseph Smith said it was. (laughs) For with the golden tablets that he found, supposedly, he also found this pair of colored glasses that were magic glasses because when he put them on, he could read the hieroglyphics on the golden tablets. So they were magical interpretive glasses by which he could read the hieroglyphics. No, that's not what the Urim and the Thummim were. But what they actually were, we don't know. Now, this robe of the ephod was to be all blue. There was to be a hole in the top of it and in the midst. And it should have a binding of woven work rounded about the hole as though it were a hole of a habergun and so it would not be torn. So it's sort of a, um, no, a hem, really, just to keep it from being torn. And beneath upon the hem thou shalt make pomegranates. Now, this is on the bottom side of, the, of this ephod. There were to be these pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet round about the hem thereof and bells of gold between them round about a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate about the hem of the robe all around it. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister and his sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord when he cometh out that he die not. Now the purpose then Around the hem of the ephod was these, were these little golden bells and, and then a pomegranate. A golden bell, a pomegranate, all the way around the hem. The purpose is that when he went into the Holy of Holies, no one could go in there except the high priest. But coming into the presence of God was a really a hazardous job. Uh, when the whole thing first got started, they realized what a hazardous occupation they'd gotten into as priests. The very first day that they started their ministry as priests, two of them got wiped out. Nadab and Abihu both got wiped out the very first day. Because when they got the whole thing set up and, and they got the altar all set and, and, the, and the wood on the altar fire came down from heaven and the wood just spontaneously started to burn. And Aaron's two sons got so excited they grabbed their little incense burners and they took strange, they took the the incense in them, but they took strange fire and they went in to offer it before God and the fire came from the altar and consumed the two sons of Aaron. It was a dangerous, hazardous job. You're coming into the presence of God and you better make sure that everything is right. If it isn't, you've had it. Now, even the high priest in coming in before God, coming into the presence of God, everything had to be just right. If it wasn't, the high priest would get wiped out. How would they know? The bells would quit ringing. So that was the purpose of the little bell. So they would tie a rope on his foot. And if the bells would quit ringing, they'd take and drag him out. (laughs) Occupational hazard. (laughs) And so that was the purpose of the little golden bells around the hem. Is that when he was ministering before God in the actual going in into this area of of coming into that area where God's presence was to meet the people, things had to be right or it could mean the life of the high priest. And so the golden bell so that they would know in, in case he died. Now thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, the crown that the priest was to wear, and on this little plate you were to grave, uh, you were to gra- engrave it on it, holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre 
upon the forefront of the mitre shall it be. So this mitre or crown, the blue crown that the priest was to wear, on it this little golden plate with the engraving, Holiness to the Lord. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead that Aaron might bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall sanctify in all their holy gifts. And it shall always be upon his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. And thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen. Thou shalt make a mitre of fine linen and thou shalt make a girdle of needlework. And for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats and thou shalt make for them girdles and bonnets and thou shalt make for them for the glory and the beauty. So they were very, uh, you know, ornament. Uh, it, it was quite, uh, I want to say ornamentation, but it was, it was very ostentatious and uh, awesome as they would come out in these robes. Thou shalt put upon Aaron thy brother and upon his sons with him. Thou shalt anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness from the loins even to the thighs so they reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come into the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister unto the holy place that they bear not the iniquity and die, it shall be a statute forever and ever and to his seed after him. So that when they're bearing the iniquity of the people, they don't die themselves. Now notice that the, the robes were all of linen. There wasn't to be any woolen garment worn by the priest. For wool causes you to sweat. And God didn't want any man sweating in his labor for him. That's very interesting, isn't it? When we look at all the perspiration that goes into the work of God today so many times. God doesn't want you to perspire in your work for him. And that is the reason why they wore linen, no wool in the garments, to keep them from perspiration in their service to God. God wants our service to be inspired service rather than perspired service. <laughs> and if you have the inspiration, it doesn't take the perspiration, but if you don't have the inspiration, I'll tell you, even the perspiration is not going to do it. And so the inspired work unto the Lord. Now in chapter 29, the consecration of the priests and the offerings. And thus they were to take a young bullock and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread and cakes of unleavened, tempered with oil and the wafers of unleavened anointed with oil. Of wheat flour shall you make them. And, they shall be, and thou shalt put them into one basket and bring the basket with the bullock and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shalt first of all wash them with water. And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat, the robe of the ephod, the ephod, the breastplate, and dress him with that curious girdle or that sash around him of the ephod and thou shalt put the crown upon his head and the holy crown upon the mitre the, the mitre and then the holy crown upon it and thou shalt take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him and thou shalt bring his sons and put coats on them and thou shalt clothe them with the girdles Aaron and his sons and put the bonnets on them and the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. Thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons. And thou shalt cause a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock. And thou shalt kill the bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Thou shalt take the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger and pour all of the blood beside the bottom of the altar 
and thou shalt take all of the fat that covers the inwards and that which is above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them and burn them upon the altar. But the flesh of the bullock and the skin uh, with his dung shalt thou burn with fire outside of the camp. It is a sin offering. So, first of all, as Aaron is consecrated, the oil signifying the anointing of God, putting on him all of these beautiful robes and all, and then anointing him with oil, and then bringing, because he is to be serving for the people before God, he had to have his sins taken care of. And so the first thing was a sin offering to take care of the sins of Aaron washing him with water, putting on these robes, anointing him with oil, and then the offering of this sin offering. Now Aaron and his sons were to put their hands on the head of the bullock. This is a symbolic action which symbolizes the transfer of my guilt over onto the the ox. As I lay my hands on the head of the ox, I would be transferring the guilt of all of my sin over onto the ox so that as that ox then has its throat slit, it is dying for my sins. It brings me the awareness of the awfulness of sin. Sin brings death. And so I see the death of that animal. I see the bloodshed and I realize that my sins were put on it and it was because of my sin that animal had to die. And the transference of my guilt onto the animal as my hands were upon its head. Now, the blood was to be taken with the finger and put on the horns, these four brass horns that were upon this brass altar. And then the fat and the kidneys were to be burned on the altar itself. But the carcass and the whole thing, because it was a sin offering, was to be taken outside of the camp and burned. Now, later we are told that that is the reason why Jesus was crucified outside of the city of Jerusalem. Let out of the camp. Because He was the sin offering. His was the sin offering being offered to God for us. And that way, that's why it had to be outside the camp that Christ was crucified. And so they led Him out of the city nearby, but out of the city, His crucifixion, out of the camp of God's people. So first of all, for the priest to serve God, he had to have something done about his own sins and thus the sin offering offered for Aaron. Now, one of the rams, Thou shalt take one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of that ram. And thou shalt slay the ram, and thou shalt take his blood and sprinkle it round about upon the altar. And thou shalt cut the ram in pieces, and wash the inwards of him and his legs, and put them into the pieces and unto his head. And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor an offering made by fire unto God. And thou shalt take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the other ram. Then thou shalt kill the ram and take his blood and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, upon the thumb of their right hands, upon the great toe of their right foot, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar and the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron, upon his garments, upon his sons, upon the garments of his sons with him. And they shall be hallowed in his garments and his sons and his sons' sons' garments with him. Also, thou shalt take of the ram, the fat and the rump and the fat that covereth the inwards and the caul above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them and the right shoulder, for it is a ram of consecration." And so, the ram for a burnt offering unto God. And that's just really as a gift to God. But then the next ram was the ram of consecration. And thus, the blood was placed upon Aaron 
and his sons on the tip of their right ear, upon their right thumb, and upon their big toe of their right foot. Remember, it's the consecration. I consecrate my ear to hear the voice of God. I consecrate my hands to do the work of God. I consecrate my feet to walk in the path of God. A life of consecration unto God. That I may hear His voice, that I might do His work, that I might walk in His path. And so the life of consecration represented by the blood on the tip of the ear, upon the right uh, thumb and upon the big toe of the right foot. As Aaron and his sons were then consecrated, their lives were to be set apart for ministry unto the Lord in this offering of consecration. And then one loaf of bread and one cake of oiled bread and one wafer out of the basket of unleavened bread, the bread that is before the Lord, and thou shalt put all in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons and shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. So they would take then these uh, loaves of bread that had been baked uh, with this oil and wheat and, and they were to wave them. And the wave offerings could be either in an up and down or in a cross fashion, but waving them before the Lord. And, and it was called the wave offering. Now the wave offerings were, were the offerings of the, of the, the meal offerings or the uh, grain offerings that they would make these little cakes out of them and wave them before the Lord. Thou shalt receive them of their hands and burn them upon the altar for a burnt offering for a sweet savor. Baked bread. What smells better than barbecue meat and break, baked bread? And so the sweet savor unto the Lord. And that's the idea of just that, uh, you know, putting them on the altar, the, the burning the ox, that neat smell that you get from uh, barbecued meat and the neat smell from baked bread and just a sweet savor unto God. Who doesn't like the savor of baking bread? Thou shalt take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it for a wave offering before the Lord and it shall be thy part. And thou shalt sanctify the breast of the wave offering and the shoulder of the heave offering which is waved, which is heaved up and the ram of the consecration, even that which is for Aaron and that which is for his sons. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons by a statute forever. So the priests could eat that portion themselves. It became theirs. For it is a heave offering, it shall be a heave offering for the children of Israel of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, even the heave offering to the Lord. And the holy garments of Aaron and his sons were to be anointed. And uh, verse 32, Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and of the bread it is, that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They shall eat those things wherewith the covering was made. Atonement in the Old Testament, kephar, is to cover. Uh, we have in the New Testament the word atonement, which is an entirely different word. In the New Testament, it is at one moment. It is becoming one with God, only possible through Jesus Christ. It was impossible, we are told, that the blood of goats and bulls could put away our sins. All they could do is testify of a better sacrifice that was to come. So they were only a substance. They were only the, rather the shadow, the substances of Christ. These things were all testifying of Jesus Christ. Our great sacrifice. The one who was sacrificed for our sins. And so it was not possible. They did not put away sin. What they did make was an atonement, kephar or kafar. They were a covering for the sins but did not put them away. It remained for Jesus to do that through His death. To consecrate, to sanctify, but a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy. And what isn't eaten was to be burned in the fire. It was just special for God's servants. Thou shalt offer every day a bullock for a sin offering for the covering, and thou shalt cleanse the altar when thou hast made the atonement for it, and thou shalt anoint it and sanctify it. Seven days thou shalt make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy. Whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy. And so it was, it, that is, 
consecrated to God once it touched the altar. You could not take it back. It then belonged to God. Whatever was laid on the altar, it became God's. Have you laid your life upon the altar? Then it becomes God. It isn't yours to take back again. It isn't. Uh, it no longer belongs to you. Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar. Two lambs of the first year every day continually. One lamb shalt thou offer in the morning and the other in the evening. And with the one lamb a tenth deal of flour mingled with a fourth part of beaten oil and a fourth part of wine for a drink offering. And the other lamb thou shalt offer in the evening. And you shall do according to the, meat, the meal offering actually of the morning and according to the drink offering thereof for a sweet savor and offering made by fire to the Lord. And this shall be continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord where I will meet you to speak there unto thee. And so that was the purpose of the tabernacle, a place where God would come and meet with them and speak unto them. And I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am Jehovah their God that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them I am Jehovah, their God. Now Moses is up on the mountain getting all of these instructions from the Lord. 